I want to talk today about um, the 17th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, which contains the famous speech that Paul the Apostle gives on the Areopagus in Athens. It's a famous passage, and it constitutes, I think, a sort of master class in the evangelization of the culture. So every step of the way, it's worth meditating on this famous uh, moment. You know, first of all, what's Paul doing in, in Greece? Well, he's passed now from Asia Minor over to the European mainland, prompted, he says, by a dream where a Macedonian is calling him to come over. Well, I love the fact that Christopher Dawson, the great uh, Catholic historian, said, here's a transition that no commentator, no historian of the time would ever have noticed, this itinerant Jewish preacher making his way from Asia Minor to Greece. But in fact, it was one of the most decisive moments in, in human history. Because in doing that, Paul is bringing the Christian faith to Europe. To say to Europe is to say eventually to Rome, and then eventually to the whole world through Europe. So this decisively important moment when Paul, prompted by his missionary impulse, uh, makes this journey. For any evangelist today, um, you're prompted to do something, to try something. And you say, well, I mean, what, what effect will this have? Who knows? Who knows? Paul didn't see it. This extraordinary effect. But that's why he's in Greece. He begins up in the north. So, you know, Macedonia, Philippi, he writes a famous letter to the Philippians. He goes um, uh, to Thessalonica up in the north, famous letter to the Thessalonians uh, later. Um, he's met with some success. So we hear about you know, a few conversions and people listening to him. But he's met with enormous opposition. He ends up in prison in Philippi. In Thessalonica, they chase him out of town by a mob. Uh, another lesson for evangelists, don't be surprised when you're opposed. So I've often talked about that when I started doing this work in, uh, in the new evangelization and media and uh, you know, the ferocious opposition. Now, thank God, I'm not getting stoned by, by angry mobs, <laughs> at least not yet. Uh, but you know, I'm getting my fair share of, of verbal abuse. Oftentimes you can feel like, boy, is anybody listening to this? Well, the Christian message has always been a bit dangerous, countercultural, uh, strange, surprising, threatening. Still is. So don't be surprised. Paul faced it too. But then I love the fact that having started up north, he makes a beeline to Athens. Now, what was Athens at the time, especially? It was arguably the cultural center of the Roman world. So the Roman Empire, of course, is spread to that part of the Mediterranean. Athens, the great city of, of Socrates and Aeschylus and Plato and Aristotle and everybody else. Even though that was 400 years before Paul. It's amazing our sense of history gets kind of truncated. Like They're all back there sometime. But Aristotle and company were 400 years before Paul. But Athens is this major, major cultural center. Good. Christians by an instinct, a deep instinct, from Paul until you know, John Paul II, have moved into cultural centers. So we don't stay simply you know, off on the, on the side someplace. We, we know Jesus wants this message to go out to all the world. So we have an instinct to go to cultural centers, centers of philosophy, centers of communication. That's where Paul goes, by, by a clear instinct to Athens. Now, what happens to him when he gets to Athens? And this is the, the setup for the speech on the Areopagus. Um, it says here, Paul waited for them in Athens, his, his fellows, and there his whole soul was revolted at the sight of a city given over to idolatry. Um, worship of false gods. Is that still a problem? Yes, that's always the problem. That's always the problem. That's always the problem. Idolatry. The worship of false gods. Now, they would have had altars to you know, various deities and so on. No, but heck, we've got altars erected to all kinds of false gods in our culture. So Paul's great revulsion at this, that's deeply biblical. That's his wonderful Jewish prophetic heritage, you know, that we're about the worship of the true God. That's what evangelization means, that we're, we're trying to bring people into the worship of the true God. Ought we to be revolted by all the idolatry we see? Yeah, yeah, he was. We should be too. But then now watch. It's not just, oh, isn't this awful? Oh, look at this cultural center, how off-kilter they are, how crazy these people are. No, no, listen to what he does. In the synagogue, he held debates with the Jews and the God-fearing. Of course, the God-fearing mean Gentiles who have kind of, you know, been sympathetic with the Jewish point of view. Paul almost always goes to the synagogues first, and we see why. His message was, 
uh, Jesus, risen from the dead, is God's yes to all the promises made to Israel. Who's going to understand that message most readily? Jews. Children of Israel will understand the message. Here's what I want people today to see. When we lose the link between Jesus and Israel, we miss the point. Jesus devolves rapidly into a bland uh, spiritual teacher of timeless truths. Can we distill timeless truths from his teaching? Sure, sure. But what's interesting about Jesus is in his dying and rising, he's the fulfillment of all the promises made to Israel. So this instinct to connect the synagogue and, and the gospel, good instinct, even for evangelists today. But then listen. And in the marketplace, he had debates every day with anyone who would face him. Now, I, I like that because I think in our cultural setting today, um, the social media represent this sort of marketplace of ideas where you confront anybody. <laughs> so if I give a talk at a church or I go to a Catholic gathering, I'll meet mostly with like-minded people. And, and that's fine. I, I'm happy to, to inform them and inspire them and so on. But I love the fact that the social media represents this kind of open marketplace of ideas. Christians should be willing and able to dialogue with anybody because Jesus said, announce this message to the ends of the world. I love how I, I heard this from his own lips when I was in Rome many years ago. Pope Benedict was talking about Irenaeus of Lyon and he was speaking about his anti-Gnostic perspective. And the Gnostics, of course, are like this little private group. right? We have our own little private truth and we whisper it among ourselves. And, and Benedict said, you know, I remember he was speaking in French, and he said, for St. Irenaeus, la foi catholique est publique. Publique, it's public. It's a public pronouncement. That from Paul on, we've been publique. We don't whisper our little message among ourselves, but we're willing and able to announce it to the whole world. Love that. Love that. Have debates every day with anyone who would listen. Good. We should still keep doing that. And then, this warms my philosopher's heart. Even a few Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Good for Paul. Is he talking to uh, average people? Sure. In the synagogue and probably on the street. Ordinary people, working class people. Sure, sure. That's part of our job. But who are the Epicureans and Stoics but the leading philosophical minds of the time? And they'd be hanging out in the capital city of, of Greco-Roman culture. Sure. Who are the top philosophers today? Who are they? Christians ought to be able to name them, ought to be able to engage them. Christian evangelists don't just whisper to uh, people at the lower end of the, of the intellectual spectrum. They talk to people at the highest end of the spectrum. Good. We should do all that today. Okay, now watch. Watch what happens. So Paul, there he is, in the synagogue, then out in the street, then with the philosophers, debating, speaking, evangelizing. Good, good. <laughs> then this. Some of them said, and these are the Epicureans and Stoics, the high-minded people. Some of them said, does this parrot know what he's talking about? Now, I love this because look at all the, 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 I'm not enough of a Greek scholar to know the nuances here, but the word being used is ambiguous in, in the Greek. Because I've seen translations, what is this babbler talking about? And one was he, what was it, scavenger. One translation had it, what's this scavenger going on about? So whatever the word is, it's a disparaging word, right? So they're, they're making fun of Paul. What's this bozo talking about, you know? Well, was he opposed up in the north? Yes. Is he opposed in the, in the cultural capital? Yes, and we shouldn't be surprised. Our, our Christian evangelists called names all the time by, by high, you know, cultural figures. Yeah, sure, sure we are. Get used to it. Get used to it. You need a thick skin, you know, in this operation. But it doesn't stop Paul. Now, this is really interesting. This is the Jerusalem Bible I'm reading from here, uh, because there's also ambiguity in the Greek. Here it says, they, the philosophers, invited him to accompany them to the Council of the Areopagus. Okay. But other translations are a little more dire, and the language is more like they compelled him to come to the Areopagus to explain himself. So what was the Areopagus? Well, it, it was, and still is, this um, kind of extraordinary uh, place. It's this, this very impressive rocky sort of hill right below the Parthenon, so right smack in the middle of, of Athens. A place where they had debates, they think, but also where they had trials. Now keep in mind, 400 years before Paul, another famous trial took place 
in Athens, namely of Socrates, who was accused of atheism and, and um, uh, corrupting the youth, right? So some translations suggest, and scholars suggest, this is not just always oh, have a friendly chat about what you're saying, that it was closer to a trial, that Paul was kind of on trial for what he was saying. But in any case, there he is in this very public place with the kind of leading figures in the culture of that time. And they're asking him and or challenging him about what he's saying. So with um, uh, Acts 17, now verse 22, we have the famous speech. And I would urge any evangelist today uh, to read it and to, to memorize it, what Paul's up to here. Because as I say, it's the master class. Here's how he begins. Men of Athens, I've seen for myself how extremely scrupulous you are in all religious matters. Because I noticed as I strolled around admiring your sacred monuments, you had an altar inscribed to an unknown God. Now, interesting thing there. Uh, you know, we just heard a few verses earlier that Paul was scandalized by the idolatry of the city. So he was, but now he's doing his speech. What Paul's doing here is what in rhetoric is called the uh, captatio benevolentiae, right? Which is the capturing of the benevolence of your audience. By the way, good rule for any public speaker at any time. Right? You start usually with some kind of self-deprecating remark or a compliment to your crowd. So that's what Paul, who knew Greek rhetoric very well, that's what he's doing. But it's more than that. Because Paul was engaging here in what the Greek fathers would later call the exploration of the logoi spermaticoi, which just means the seeds of the word. So Paul's got the word, right? The word made flesh in Jesus. But there are hints and echoes and anticipations of that word in whatever is good, true, and beautiful in the culture you're evangelizing. So Paul's saying, hey, I've been walking around your city, and even though in one side of his heart saying, look at all this idolatry, but he also saying, I, I get it, you're a religious people. There's a religious instinct in you. Now, from Paul through Thomas Aquinas to G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis and everybody else, that's a really good instinct to follow, is to, is to find the, what the Latins call the semina of Erbi, the seeds of the word, in whatever culture you're in. My mentor, Cardinal George, always said, and you know, Cardinal George, who could be very sharply critical of the culture, but he said, you can't finally evangelize a culture you don't love, which has always struck me as perfectly right. Uh, if you just hate the culture, you're just at war with it, you will not evangelize it effectively. So Paul, by a very good instinct, uh, looks for the seeds of the word. As I say, you can't imagine Augustine without that move. You can't imagine Aquinas without that move. You can't imagine John Paul II without that move. So very important for evangelizers. But that's not all he does. If, if that's all you do, that's if you want the left-wing problem, you know? that you just see Christianity as one more example of, of a, a cultural religious form. You know? Listen now as Paul goes on. Since the God who made the world and everything in it is himself Lord of heaven and earth, he does not make his home in shrines made by human hands. Now mind you, where is he standing as he says that? And that's what struck me when I went to the Areopagus in Athens. He's standing right below, like it's right up there, the Parthenon, which was the greatest pagan religious temple in the world. At the heart of it was this, now long gone, but giant statue of the goddess Athena. Paul's saying, hey, the God I'm talking about does not make his home in shrines made by human hands, like yours here. Say. So having complimented them, he immediately critiques the idolatry within the culture. That rhythm, that move, is typical of evangelists at their best. It avoids, if you want, the extremes of both left and right. It's the yes to the culture and the great no to the culture, all as a propedeutic to what? The declaration of the novelty of the good news. Um, listen to this now as Paul continues this speech. Now he, God, is telling everyone everywhere they must repent because he's fixed a day when the whole world will be judged and judged in righteousness. And he's appointed a man to be the judge. And God has publicly proved this by raising this man from the dead. Ah, now he's talking about the heart of the gospel. 
Jesus risen from the dead. Compliments the culture, critiques the culture as a preparation for the declaration of this decisive manifestation of the Logos, Jesus risen from the dead. Christian evangelists don't um, shy away from this. They don't permanently put it off. Your ultimate purpose is the declaration of Christ risen from the dead. Okay, now just one, one more point. At this mention of rising from the dead, some of them burst out laughing. <laughs> so, you know, when I read this now, I think, Paul, Brother Paul, I, I'm with you, man. I get it. I get it. The number of times, you know, like in, in my social media outreach, the number of times I've been, for want of a better term, laughed at for things I say, I mean, I, they're, they're countless. The culture has always found, finds, will always find, the Christian proclamation crazy. Some, some in the culture always will. Because it is this kind of crazy good news of Jesus having gone to death, now risen from the dead, and the source of grace for the world. Strange message? Uh-huh. It always was. Don't believe people today that say, oh, you know, those ancient people, oh, they, they bought any old crazy nonsense. Oh, the pre-scientific, poor things. They believed in these you know, crazy people coming back from the dead. No, they didn't. No, they, listen, they were pre-scientific. They weren't stupid. They knew dead people stayed in their graves. You know, I mean, of course they did. And so they, they laugh at this, this, this claim that Paul was making. My point is not to deny the resurrection. It's to say it's always been a, a strange and disturbing message. But yet Paul confidently proclaims it. Now, I love this, how it ends. After that, Paul left them, but there were some who attached themselves to him and became believers. Among them, Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman called Damaris and some others besides. Now, you're Paul. You're the Apostle Paul. You've seen the risen Christ. You want to proclaim him to the world. You've gone to the cultural capital of your world. You've gone to Athens. You've debated with philosophers. You've gone to the Areopagus itself. You proclaim this message. And what's your payoff? Well, a lot of them laughed at you, most walked away, and a couple of people said, yeah, maybe we'll, where's that line again? Maybe we'll, others said, we'd like to hear you talk about this again. That's the payoff. That's what Paul got, right? Could you understand if Paul went back to his, his room that night and thought, okay, well, that was kind of a bomb, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That evangelical outreach, that didn't go very well. But wait, who are Dionysius the Areopagite? Who's this woman called Damaris and others besides? But the seeds from which European Christianity developed, right? This is Paul now planting the faith in Europe. As it grew through Europe, it eventually grew to the ends of the world. So the fact that I'm recording these words on the distant shore of a continent Paul never even knew existed, but the beginning of it were these handful of people that said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll listen to you again on this. You know? Final lesson to evangelists, um, don't get discouraged at, at what appear to be uh, poor results of your work. Who's listening to me? Who cares about this? I mean, come on, I'm wasting my time. You have no idea what God can do with a couple little seeds that were planted by your proclamation of the word. So anyway, take a look at your, get your Bibles out and um, Acts 17 and the speech of Paul on the Areopagus, masterclass for evangelizers.